masters, masters, masters of change. Hello there. Welcome to Masters of Change. My name is Kim Cuneo, and I'm the head of music at the Australian National University. And I'm here in discussion with my good friend Charlie Hogg. And Charlie and I, we're really investigating the little things of life in a spiritual sense. Welcome, Charlie. Thanks, Kim. Well, Charlie, we're coming towards the end of a very interesting series on karma. So I want to ask you, just for a little bit of revision, first of all, what is karma? Kim, karma is action. It's the law of cause and effect, the law of sowing and reaping. It sort of is a way of expressing this law that when I do an action, it's not that the effect goes away. Whatever I throw out into life will come back to me. So it's a wisdom, it's a law of wisdom to really design my life by realizing I create my destiny by the quality of actions I perform. Charlie, in some of our past episodes, you've talked a lot about the, the motivation behind actions, but if someone's just tuning in now, could you give us a quick summary of why our motivation is so important? Yeah, Kim, really the power of an action, the effect of an action, is the intent or the motive. So what's the real feeling behind the action? Is the feeling one of great love? was the feeling one of great anger. Whatever is the intent, intent, it sort of colours the outcome of the action. So you can do the same action. You can tell someone something with a lot of love, so the intent is loving. You can tell something the same thing with a lot of anger. So the action is complete, the effect of the action is completely different. And so that's why really spirituality is about creating such a state of mind that the intents in my actions are the highest. They come from the purest place within myself. Mm. And that's in a sense an insurance policy for good karma. Mm. You know, when you were speaking about that, I also thought of, you know, people do the wrong things sometimes and just say you've broken the law in, in quite a serious manner. You're being sentenced by the judge and it seems to me that the judge says so-and-so has displayed genuine remorse of the mm. actions. I'm going to lower the sentence. Yeah. So it's like, even in the human level, we have a quite a profound understanding of what karma is. Yes, we do. Mm. I think we do, Kim, because we can see every day the effects of our actions. And you know, sometimes something happens, I get emotional, I get upset, I get angry, and often the repercussions of that can be a damaged relationship for years, you know. Brahma Baba, the founder of the Brahma Kumari, said that get angry once and it'll affect your life for six months. Because it's almost like everyone has a little digital camera here. When, you, when I go, ah, you go click, 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 and you store it on the hard disk, that behavior. And every time, you know, you come in front of me for the next six months, I'm thinking, are they going to lose their temper? So the carelessness of one second can have you know, affect your life for months and even years. Mm. So that's where really when I have cared for my inner world and I, I don't just spontaneously do that action, then you know, that's what spirituality is, is, you know, preparing myself so these sort of behaviours don't come out and then affect my life for months and years. Mm. Charlie, this is a very nice introduction. So I have a question about the sanskaras and karma. Mm. So, you know, because you've taught us in the past that by the time we do an action, even a few times, we're starting mm. to create this thing that's called the sanskara. So could you please just give us a quick recap on what that is and then how it might play a part in the creation of karma? Mm. You know, Kim, um, the French philosopher Rousseau once said, everywhere man is born free, but everywhere he's in chains. So ostensibly it's like we're free, but we all carry the chains of our past in the form of our sanskaras. So in past lives or even in childhood or my past life, 
what happens is when I do a repeated negative action, it becomes a habit. And so these habits begin to dominate me and they keep affecting my present and disturbing my judgments. You know, they influence my assessment of a situation. And so in a way, my past actions form sanskaras in my subconscious, mm -hmm. these impressions, and these sanskaras sort of manipulate my behavior in the present. So in my intellect, I might want to be really loving, but my sanskara tells me to react with anger, and the anger comes out, and therefore I'm increasing my karmic story rather than re resolving my karmic story. So this is, it's amazing, but it's also a bit scary, isn't it? That, <laughs> that as mm. you said, we can be the prisoner of our past we with, can. without even knowing it. So no matter how good my motivation is right now, it's like I have a potential little hole underneath me and I can fall into the well. Mm. And there's, I wanted to share with you actually a, a story that is a Tibetan story that's just about this moment. So the story goes that I'm walking down a road, I see a hole, I fall into it. The next day I'm walking down a road, I see a hole, I look at it for the second time, I fall down it. The next day I'm walking down the road, I stop and think, is this a hole? I still fall down the hole. The fourth time I stop, I look and I stop at the hole and I still fall into it. And the fifth time I'm able to stop and not fall into the hole. <laughs> Is this spiritual development and understanding our sanskars that the Tibetans are talking about? It absolutely mm. is, Kim. Because, mm. you know, sometimes I think there's three layers of transformation on the spiritual journey. One is the layer of change of habits, which are sort of the things you pick up in your life to do with your family and your culture. They can change quite easily. Mm. So you may only have to come to the fall down the hole once. The next, what I would call soft sanskaras, perhaps recorded in the last few lifetimes. Mm. And these can be impatience, intolerance, focusing on people's defects. And with spiritual practice and meditation, you become more patient, more tolerant. But the third level are really those really deep impressions that have been recorded in the soul for life after life. And I feel for most of us, the main ones are fear, lack of self-respect, insecurity. These sorts of things have been so deeply recorded that we just keep falling in the hole. Even when I intellectually understand, I know I don't want to fall in the hole, but I keep doing. Because, you know, let's say there's a, you know, a relationship breakdown and that makes me feel insecure. And I can tell myself it's okay, I've got a relationship with God, and yet I keep falling back into the hole of insecurity. Mm. This is the, the long-term work of spirituality, I would say, where you just keep on keeping on until you stop really falling in the hole, hole of insecurity. Not by saying, oh, I shouldn't fall in the hole, but by creating such security in my relationship with God and an understanding that that is imperishable. No matter what changes, that's never going to change. Then it sort of heals me of this habit to easily feel inadequate, insecure, afraid, or whatever it may be. Charlie, it's very good that you've brought up you know, the sanskaras that can bring us down. But of course there can be also positive sanskaras. Yeah. So I'd like to ask you to inspire us with some of the stories of these positive sanskaras that we can carry from birth to birth. Yeah, I think, um, Kim, that, you know, our beautiful idea really is that the recording of peace is in us the whole time. Why would we search for peace if we haven't tasted it? We can only search for it because we know peace. We only search for true love because we've known it. And that's um, why Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, the American psychiatrist, would always say that, you know, when we feel grief, it's not just the grief of what the loss of a relationship or a conflict. The real original grief is that I stepped away from perfect love, the love of God. And so, you know, these things just bring up 
so they're always there. And we have so many good sanskaras that also carry with me from life to life. And some people have the sanskara of being absolutely honest. Mm. Some people have the sanskara of forgiving easily. Some people, and I, I know one person, something will happen, she may get a bit head up, in five minutes it's completely wiped from her memory track. She just lets it go. It's natural in her. So sometimes we have many natural sanskaras. So it's a mixture. And actually, we, most of our sanskaras, I think, are really beautiful. But some of these habits and the fear habit and the lack of self-respect habit, most of us have them pretty deeply and they take time to work on and transform. Mm. So, Charlie, how I understand what you're saying <clears throat> is that we build up this sort of, it's a suite of sanskaras that then can influence our life. And they start to make a subtle sort of effect on the soul. And I know in the past you've used the term dust on the soul, mm. which I find really beautiful because the soul doesn't suffer as such, but it can be a little bit dusty. Can you tell us about how that happens? And then could you prescribe a remedy? <laughs> well, I mean, the dust on the soul, the original blueprint is pure. As we mm. accumulate body consciousness, it's like a... A dust that, you know, imagine the soul's like a shining diamond mm. and then it's sort of, it's tarnished. And that's really like the human soul. It sort of becomes tarnished. It, the sparkle goes. And you know, you know how you meet some people and they literally sparkle. It's like the soul is sparkling. But when sometimes the tarnish comes up, the soul sort of becomes cloudy in that way. And really the way to begin to work on these sanskaras is, is to make a plan. Because I think a lot of people on the spiritual journey sort of hope that if I keep meditating and studying and practicing, one day I'll change. I think we've got to be a little bit more organized. And I feel to identify your main sanskara that affects your life, let's say it's self-respect, I did this once. You know, I was in the headquarters in Mount Abu and I really realized how self-respect or lack of it affects every part of your life. Mm. And so I really, I made a plan and I observed the things in my life which triggered a sense of lack of self-respect. Sometimes it's a personality, sometimes it's a situation. And rather than just bowing down and let, you know, oh, Sanskari, you're so powerful, you're now in control, you're the authority, I started to apply a different aspect of truth. And I would say I was 5% successful, then 10%, then 15%. But what happens is that it takes time, but the incredible thing is, is that you start to develop the confidence I can change. Because really deep down, I feel often we feel, well, yeah, I can change a few habits. I've changed a bit of my nature that I present to the world, but some of this deep stuff, it's too deep. But actually, when I develop a plan and I stick with it over months and months and months, I see myself shifting out of an old set of behaviours, an old pattern. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Charlie, you know, I imagined myself as a child when you were speaking, because on one level, of course, we are all children anyway. Yeah. But, you know, when we have a child... I remember I, when I first discovered ice cream, I was a little bit older. We didn't really have ice cream at home till I was about 11 or 12. And then I discovered ice cream. It was incredible. You know? <laughs> I couldn't believe so much sugar and fat all in the one bowl. <laughs> and I just wanted to have more and more of it. But now as an adult, I hardly eat it. So something did happen to me, didn't it? Yeah. You know? And even though on one selfish thing I just wanted to have ice cream every day, I grew up. Mm. And so could you tell us about what happens when we grow up? I think this is such a beautiful potential we all have. Yeah, it's mm. a, it's, that's mm. a very interesting thing because mm. I see the spiritual journey in phases actually. Mm. As a child it's all new and it's exciting and changes quick because mm. it's just habits. As you're growing up you have to face a few obstacles and... Um, but with a little bit of effort and practice, you begin to change things, your nature. But often I've seen, Kim, that after so many years, um, it's like a whole lot of rubbish can come out, mm. you know. Um, 
And the reason is, I think, because we have suppressed a lot. Our habit, if I can say from religion, is because we often found it hard to change myself, I would suppress it. So I have a face for the world which is very polite and very sweet, but what I am inside is something different. And these are my, it's not bad or wrong, it's like the deep sanskaras come out at some point. And I call it a spiritual midlife crisis, you know. Mm. And quite frankly, some people feel, I don't think the spiritual journey really works. But actually, that's the very time that it's almost like I develop a maturity on the spiritual journey to know that, you know, I have to have the power to face, be so honest with myself, yes, this is my sanskara. This is my weakness. I'm not going to pretend it's not me, but this is why I'm here to bring change. And I think that honesty and then working with it over the time, you free yourself. And to me, that's the ultimate success of the spiritual journey. I heal myself sometimes of some very deep habitual sanskara patterns that have often been like a, a cloud, a shadow over my life since I can remember. Mm. Charlie, this is a beautiful narrative. When you spoke it, I thought of the term renunciation. Mm. So it's like at some point, if we want to bring in the new, we do have to put a full stop on the old. We do. And on one level, it can be quite hard, but I wanted to give a simple example. When we are a young person, we might have a friend, and that friend we really enjoy being with, and then we see over time that that friend has dangerous behaviours, and they mm. might be less and less positive in our life. We still have a high regard, but... We don't want to be around that friend because maybe one time the friend has the police called and the next time we find out the friend has stolen something or all of these things can happen. So over time we make our peace with that friend but we move on. And it seems like we have a few friends like that in ourselves. We do. You know, we have our lower self and it's mm. worth acknowledging that we're not perfect, yeah. that we all have our own little defilements and weeds growing in the garden. And what you're saying is, if we really want to make an effort to not take these sanskaras into the next birth, we have to do the weeding. You know, really, it's so interesting you say that, Kim, because I think sometimes when I really look at them, we realise that we've done all these avoidance behaviours. Sometimes we suppress them. Sometimes we deny them. Sometimes we design a life to avoid them triggering my stuff. I feel I've changed, but actually... I just live in my comfort zones and I don't... Or well, sometimes I go onto the front foot and I blame everything external for what I am. But I think one of the great wisdoms is we get to the point I'm just going to now honestly face and accept who I am. Mm -hmm. And I find that when someone has that courage, a beautiful vibration comes into their face. It's a, one of great wisdom and understanding and you know what I've experienced is that when you really face your own demons you have so much compassion for others and their demons so that you know when people are going through their stuff you know sometimes they're awkward they're difficult they're reactive because they're going through their internal upheaval and people react to them like that but we sort of have even more compassion because we know they're going through this cleansing this healing, and it can look a bit ugly sometimes. It can look very difficult, but if I offer them, it's the very time to offer loving support to a person who's going through mm. one of these periods of upheaval. Mm. So it's like we're seeing the potential of that soul, even when things aren't going well, and then conversely we need to have the internal gaze that can see our own self-potential, even yeah. when things aren't going well. Yeah, mm. yeah. And uh, I think that to keep that vision on the self, you know, no, I'm going through a little bit of a turbulent period, but everything will be okay, you know? I think that's um, a part of the journey too, isn't it? That you go through the phases. And I find that when I really, you know, face myself, and strangely on the spiritual journey, some stuff sometimes emerges that I... I've never even had before I was practicing spirituality. And then some people think, I'm going backwards, it's not working. Mm. But actually it is, it's like sometimes deeper accounts come out 
some stuff that's been buried that wasn't apparent in my teens or even, mm. and it just emerges. And some people think, well, I've become a spiritual person. I've, I'm worse, but actually you're not worse. It's just that it's coming up to be cleared and healed. And you need, sometimes I think one thing is, you know, the aim of where I want to go. But the next thing is how to manage this journey, how to manage the different upheavals that may come in my way, the different challenges. Mm. And I often feel whatever happens, never, ever give up. The spiritual journey is the journey to my truth. There is no better investment in a quality life than that. So that no matter how tough, and it can get tough, we know it can get tough. It can get very tough. And that's why some people sort of give up. But what I've seen is many times they resume again after some years. Mm. Charlie, this is a message of great hope to me. It because is. Because it says, mm. you know, there's a point where we all sort of wake up and we realise I've been an active player in my own unhappiness. <laughs> yeah. You know? And then, then I start mm. to make these changes and then we even start to say, I've been an active player in the unhappiness of others. Yeah. And then I start to make these reparations and then we start to finally say, what can I do to create this stable, loving relationship at the mm. heart of all things? It seems to me this is, a, this is a narrative that is possible and if we really take the view of multiple lifetimes, probable, yeah. that we are evolving spiritually. This is not a one-off thing. But if we really have this intention, over time and over these multiple births, we can evolve to a very, very high state. So I want to ask you to take us on a slightly different meditation, a meditation of imagining beyond this body mm. to the future destiny of the soul. Mm. Let us focus my thoughts on my inner world and know that each thought is my creation. Meditation is creating the thoughts that I want create an experience I want. As I go on this spiritual journey, I come sometimes to some very deep sanskaras, impressions of the past which take me into deep states of hopelessness or inadequacy. Sometimes they can feel so strong. And yet, the original blueprint of the soul is pure, is peaceful, is loving, and is happiness. With determination I get from my relationship with God and with the courage I receive through the experience of God's love, I start to step back into the original blueprint of my sanskaras. I realized I was pure. I became impure, but I can become completely pure again. The world is changing. The cycle of time is always moving. And the cycle of time is pointing us to a new world, a golden age. So my spiritual work now 
is preparing myself, recreating my original sanskaras to become a deity, to live in a divine world, heaven, where all my sanskaras are completely pure. This is my life of transition, of leaving the old and stepping back into my golden, aged, divine sanskaras of a deity. Dear brothers and sisters, we've just had an exquisite meditation where we've gone beyond the relationship of this body and the soul. And Charlie's told us a hopeful story. It's like a little jewel of the heart that we ourselves can evolve to be as great as those we most laud. Isn't that incredible? That we have in us the seeds of how Charlie described it, a golden agedness, to be perfect beings, to be people who are so evolved that our original self comes back, which is a self that wants to help others, a self that is in self-respect, a self that is at one with God and is able to be part of the unfoldingment of peace in our world. Charlie, this is so exciting to me. I know we're, we've got to finish now, but do you really think this is possible? I do, Kim. <laughs> well, I'm so delighted to hear that. <laughs> so I wanted to say to everyone, we can start modestly, but never let us lose sight mm. of what is possible. We are all here. Charlie and I are with you. Shivani is with you. The whole wonderful team from Australia and India, we're with you to inspire you to evolve spiritually. Mm. Do your best. Have no fear. <laughs> Om Shanti. Thank you, Kim. Om Shanti.